Should Christians be thankful for the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms? It was March 19th when the White House released a statement explaining that crime is decreasing in the United States. That statement is wonderfully well written. However, even the casual observer can see a very different story. And let's not be alarmists, but let's be realists. As sin and debauchery of various types is endorsed in our land, crime will continue to increase. Crime is a major problem in the big cities across America. It's really bad in places like New York City and Los Angeles and Chicago. And it's bad where I grew up in North Minneapolis and even in Indianapolis where I served the Lord at a rescue mission. Plus, it was recently reported that in Dearborn, Michigan, Muslims were chanting death to America. This chant is not taking place just in Iraq or some obscure place in the Middle East, but it's taking place on American soil. Certainly, we praise God for law enforcement officers who are in a Romans 13 sense, the ministers of God. However, it's situations like I've just described that persuade me that Christians need to own guns and we need to know how to use them. But you might ask, what is the biblical validation for self-defense with a lethal weapon? After all, religious groups such as the Amish and the Quakers and the Mennonites, they have the pacifistic notion that self-defense runs contrary to the teachings of the Bible. The pacifist argues that we're to turn the other cheek. But let's be clear. When Jesus said turn the other cheek, he wasn't saying, if someone hurts your child, offer him your other child. In no way does turn the other cheek support the idea that Jesus was against self-defense. As a matter of fact, it's Exodus 22, where we find that the Bible teaches us that if a thief comes into your house and you hit him with lethal force and he dies, you're not guilty of anything. In Luke 22, missionaries are instructed to acquire a sword, a lethal weapon for self-defense. It's in Matthew 26 where Peter uses a sword to cut off the high priest's ear, Malchus. And in that passage, Jesus does rebuke Peter, not for having the lethal weapon, but for using it incorrectly. Jesus instructs Peter to put his sword in the sheath, and then Jesus addresses the core of the problem, which was Peter's misguided heart. The lethal weapon was not the problem, the mentality of the one wielding it was. We must understand that while violence can be evil, it can also be good. If a female is being violently raped and someone uses a tool of violence, a gun, to stop the rape of that lady, that hero is to be commended. Violence or rape is evil, but stopping the rape and saving the woman's life showcases violence as a virtue. If courageous Christians take the life of evil individuals in self-defense, we must remember that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But in 1 Peter, the Bible instructs husbands to protect their wives. I mean, parents, a father and a mother, they need to be willing and ready to protect their children. And men specifically need to be prepared to protect their wives and family. Self-defense with lethal force is always a last resort. But if it ever comes to that, a Christian needs to be prepared. Interestingly, the wall constructors in Nehemiah chapter 4, they held a lethal weapon in one hand and worked on the wall with the other hand. They were rightly ready to defend themselves and defend their building project. Remember, the Bible teaches us that life is precious because we're made in the image of God. And since life is precious, it's worth defending.